Peace, everyone. Peace. Peace, everyone. Peace. Good evening, folk warriors. Good evening, my name. Peace, everyone. Peace. Can you see me? Yes. I'm hiding behind the pole. <laughs> this is the Don Yoder lecture in religious folk life. And uh, our lecturer this year is Erica Brady. I have to say that Diane Goldstein and I were speaking earlier, and Dr. Yoda used to always ask when he would come to the AFS, he would say to the crowd, how many of you are my former students? Would you please stand? So could we have any Don Yoder student, please stand. Of group, if I have to, if ever I've seen one, and beautiful. Well, we want to get on to our lecture, and it is by oh, I want to, have to say our our uh, folk belief and religious folk folk life section business meeting will be at is it twelve fifteen, Maggie, twelve fifteen on Saturday. That's correct. And please come to that, and please do not forget that we have silent auction auction with items in the book room to help us with the Don Yoder Prize and the William Wilson, under, the Don Yoder Graduate Student Prize and the William Wilson Undergraduate Prize. So please go in and look at those items that are in the silent auction and please spend as much money as you possibly can. <laughs> and uh, I can assure you, Maggie wants me to assure you that she and I do not go out for lunch or dinner with that money. <laughs> That definitely goes to the to the monies for the winners of the prizes, and we'll announce those prizes at the section meeting. Maggie, any other business you think? No. I want to introduce our lecturer for this year, and that is Dr. Erica Brady. And I have a little bit of information about Erica for those of you that don't know. First of all, Erica has a Bachelor of Arts from Harvard University from Radcliffe College where she was majoring in folk studies. Erica, you must be so smart. <laughs> oh my gosh. And then Erica has a Master of Arts from the UCLA Folklore and Comparative Mythology Program. And she has her PhD from the Folklore Institute at Indiana University with a certificate in medieval studies. She arrived at Western Kentucky University in 1989 and she is currently the acting head of the Department of Folk Studies and Anthropology uh, while Michael Ann Williams has been banished from the school. <laughs> she is the uh, senior, well that's what you told me to say, Erica. <laughs> she is the the senior producer and host of the weekly NPR radio program, Barron River Breakdown. She is an AFS fellow. She is a Kentucky Colonel. I don't know what that means exactly. Is that a great honor? Is it fantastic? And she's the, the proud electee to the National Thumbpickers Hall of Fame. I didn't make that up. <laughs> I, I met Erica back in, uh, I believe it was 1987, at a conference at Notre Dame University, which was on the theme, the culture of American Catholicism. And we were there both giving papers on holy cards at that time. And uh, we did that panel, and then we had one egg of a lunch together, as you can imagine, talking about holy cards and comparing those ideas. And opera, exactly. And all I can say is that Erica is as delightful now as she was then in 1987. So I'm so grateful that Erica could be here with us. And I give you now the 2015 Don Yoder Lecturer. And before I give her name, I want to say that the title of her lecture is A Subtle Thing with All Reflections on the Ineffable, the Unspeakable, and the Risible in Vernacular Religion. I give you Dr. Erica Brady. <laughs> Thank you.
Good evening, folklorists. Ladies, gentlemen, possums. <laughs> thank you, Leonard. Thank you, Maggie, for inviting me. This is a, a tremendous honor, and I'm just thrilled to be here. Uh, I do feel very strongly that all important presentations ought to begin with a quotation from Augustine of Hippo. <laughs> so, here you go, here you are. Those things which seem almost shameful to the inexperienced, whether simply spoken or actually performed either by the person of God or by me, whose sanctity is commended to us, are all figurative, and their secrets are to be removed as kernels from the husk, as nourishment for charity. Since this paper is in part about the kind of play in which very different representations are just opposed in ways that are both provocative and entertaining, I want to acknowledge two important and very different presences who were much with me as I developed this talk. I never had Don Yoder as a teacher, but I have been taught by those he taught. I looked forward to the possibility of his presence this evening and mourned with those who knew him better when I found out that this was not to be. In the study of vernacular or folk religion, all paths lead to Don Yoder. Also present to me at every step was Elliot Oring. Honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award at this meeting, Elliot presented a uh, honored with a Lifetime Achievement Award at this meeting. Elliot presented a summer term seminar on the ethnography of humor, uh, which I enrolled while I was at IU, and it was one of the best graduate classes I ever experienced. A year or so ago, he at last returned by mail my final paper on, <laughs> on Freud as a humorous storyteller. He had given me a B. <laughs> on the post-it note affixed to the mailing, he admitted that it should have been an A, which is actually totally true, <laughs> um, but was an unprecedented reversal for Eliot. Uh, his creative and critical perspective informs this work, bedeviling my every step. As he would be the first to point out, he is not responsible for any errors into which I slip. <laughs> the enigmatic 14th century poetic work called for convenience Piers Plowman ought to beguile folklorists for the same reason it is the despair of literary historians and critics. Literary scholars have wrangled tirelessly and sometimes peevishly over the authorship and provenance of the versions extant. The folklorist is by training and temperament equipped to deal with the variant texts with equanimity. I love that word. Nor does obscure or diverse authorship of a work in itself dismay the folklorist, as it sometimes does the literary scholar. Folklore is a field in which craftsmanship is recognized as individual and participatory. Finally, the rich, even rank, popular strain of the poem is not an embarrassment to the folklorist. Better not be, or you better leave now. Um, in fact, as, as, as it has been to some readers of refined sensibilities, it is the very rootedness in the intimate details and patterns of the daily life of all sorts and conditions of men and women, which made vivid with the pitch and vigor of the poet's gift, arouses our particular enthusiasm. Indeed, an understanding of popular and traditional as well as literary genres of the time is required for a full appreciation of the poem. A domain cre created by a creative genius and, a, and an eccentric one, Piers Plowman represents a fair field full of folklore, the tilling of which must be undertaken for the poem's complexities and ambiguities to bear fruit. And the work is particularly rich in content <coughs> pertaining to riddles. I first began worrying about Langland's riddles, and indeed one particular riddle, as a graduate student under the men mentorship of the extraordinary scholar E. Talbot Donaldson, who was not a folklorist and wasn't quite sure about them, particularly Dick Dorson. Um, at the time, I accepted the received wisdom that the literary riddling strategies were deployed by Langland and other clerics to embody and illumine a work's major themes to the initiated and at the same time to veil them from the understanding of the overeager, the impertinent, and the vulgar. I am no longer so sure. I have begun to see them as I see medieval church carvings and manuscript illumination that to our contemporary eyes seem inappropriate, grotesquely erotic, and scatological. 
in a metaphorical reverie on these matters, my own dream vision, if you like, I found myself pondering all those D-I words that suggest both separation and synthesis. Division, divigation, digression, discourse, divination, diversion, and only homophonically related, the word divine. Let's begin then with Piers Plowman. There is virtually no aspect of the poem without confusions giving rise to controversy. Even calling it the poem is a lazy scholar's refuge, since it was written extensively and rewritten at least two times. In this paper, I will concentrate on the so-called B text, written about 1376, and I shall return to prefer to both the poet and the character of the narrator as Will Langland. The assignation of this name to the poet, accepted by all but a few scholars, depends in part on an apparent cryptogram, actually a little riddle, uh, if you will, in which the narrator states, I have lived in Lond, my nam is Long Will. But the use of the name Will also functions as part of the allegorical contravance of the poem. My choice of the B text is not merely determined by the length and fullness of this version. In fact, no other version was possible. It is in the B text almost exclusively that Langland makes use of riddles as a rhetorical technique, which suggests some things about separate authorship, which I will not get into. The B text is a report of a series of mysterious dreams. The poet goes to sleep on a May morning and sees a meadow filled with a lively crowd in which a lady named Holy Church, it's really quite boring, appears and delivers a homily to Will directing him to seek truth, with a capital T, uh, although he prote protests that he has no kinda knowing, kind knowing, or native wit. He observes the shenanigans of a much more interesting lady of dubious rep repute, Lady Mead or Lady Reward, whom the character Conscience refuses to marry. Conscience preaches a lively sermon on the seven deadly sins, who could resist that, and Will and the personified seven decide to set out in search of truth together. Now, this is really quite an assemblage, the seven deadly sins and Will. Um, though like Frodo, they have no idea how to go about their quest. Piers Plowman, who sometimes represents the sturdy laboring man and sometimes represents Christ himself, appears to the searchers and offers to lead them. But his way proves less entertaining than the Chaucerian ramble that the seven deadly sins had in mind. Piers sets them to honest but dreary farmers toil in the fields at which they balk until threatened by an appalling figure called hunger. Their labor in the field represents the medieval theological concept of the active life which in Langland's terms is to do well, who also becomes a personified character. The personified concepts of do well, do better, and do best are considered in the remainder of the poem by a number of characters, such as Patience, Conscience, Lady Scripture, and Anima, or Soul. The recurring figure of Piers Plowman, more and more explicitly identified with Christ, as a means of salvation, and truthfully, less and less comprehensible as a human character, unifies Will's search for do well, do better, and do best. The medieval tradition of riddling, both literary and popular, can shed much light on the poet's obfuscation of certain points in the poem. An intentional obfuscation and a creation of apparently irresolvable opposition paradoxically coupled with a preoccupation with the problem of interpretation. With this issue of interpretation, one moves into an area of particular concern, both in the content and the intent of medieval literature. The five genres most frequently proposed as models for Langland in the writing of Piers Plowman, sermon, dream visions, drama, allegorical dialogue, and apocalyptic prophecy, all demand the intensely active participation of the audience as interpreters. The demand is, in many instances, expressed directly by a speaker who embodies or has experienced the symbolic representation of a truth. This is what I saw. This is what I am. The audience is challenged by the immediacy of this directly discoursing I to respond to the implicit or explicit question, 
What's this about? What does this mean? Our understanding of the compelling nature of this immediacy is intensified when we remember that the audience to which the demand for interpretation is addressed is understood to be a physically present body of listeners, like you all, you know, presented by, like me. Not a solitary reader distanced from the challenge of the medium, by the, distanced from the challenge by the medium of the written page. The riddle, like literary genre is recognized as influence on Langland, is an expression of a problem in symbolic interpretation expressed in urgent person-to-person -person terms, more condensed, more concise than highly formalized genres. Now, Langland would have been familiar with both composed literary riddles and, the popular, and popular riddles from his childhood. Their presence in his professional and social life very probably remained lively well into his adulthood. Children of the Middle Ages in the France and England, as elsewhere, told riddles as a form of play. Uh, Frederick Whitman cites Pompeius uh, Geminus def definition of the riddle in the third century, for example, as that which little boys play among themselves when they ask small questions, or questinculus, which is a lovely word, <laughs> no, which no one understands. But it is clear that riddling as a social activity was not restricted to children alone. Sophisticated collections of popular riddles, such as Les Edavineaux Amoureux of the 15th century, indicate that at least up until the era of the late Middle Ages, riddling sessions were conducted among adults as part of a stylized, flirtatious, and indeed eroticized social interaction, along with the sharing of puzzles and curious mathematical problems. The content of the late medieval riddles, represented by the collections edited by James W. Hassel and Bruno Roy, is a complex mixture testing knowledge of scripture, understanding of the nature of social realities such as courtship and kinship, and ability to recognize familiar household objects and animals described in unfamiliar terms. <laughs> what has it got in its pocket, says? Although these collections are French, uh, they appear to reflect a tradition common to both England and France. A manuscript set down by the Holm family in England two centuries later contained much the same proportion of biblical riddles, puzzles, and problems in genealogy. In I, my own grandpa, it's kind of the contemporary reflex of that. Although these, uh, sorry, in all these collections, there is a striking number of the so-called pseudo-erotic riddles in Les Edavineaux Amoureux, some 15% of the riddles may have alternate scatological or erotic answers as well as innocent ones. In the Holm manuscript, the proportion is about 12%. The pseudo-erotic content of literary riddles in the Anglo-Saxon England, composed by clerics, is well attested. Uh, evidently, this variety of popular riddle was remained con uh, current through Langland's time and well beyond enjoying a widespread appreciation and acceptance. Now, although it's a sturdy part of our disciplinary lexicon, I confess that I don't much like the term pseudo-erotic. It strikes me as being almost as coy a periphrastic coinage as the riddles it describes. They flat out are erotic <laughs> or scatological or otherwise transgressive. The fact that they are offered discursively as a trap for the unwary or the skittish seems to me to skirt or to unskirt the point that we are highly <laughs> entertained by highly disparate interpretations brought together under a single sign. If students of the nature of humor are correct in the, its origin in the receiver's perception of incongruity, superiority, or relief, then elements of all three may be discerned in a heightened form in the transgressive riddle. Langland's early education would in part have taken the form of educational riddles. While detailed sources on teaching methods of the period are a little scanty, it is evident that certain consistent patterns were maintained from the post-classical period well into Langland's time and beyond. We know that the first item of priority was to teach little boys their grammar, Latin grammar, of course, and this was accomplished by rote. An instructor recited the day's textbook lesson grammar rules or instructional material to his class, who, once able to take dictation, copied it onto wax ta tablets and memorized it for the following day. In order to facilitate this memorization, these lessons were almost invariably in verse. 
uh, often in a question and answer form. At least appears that from it at least appears from the fifth century, the time of Symphosius, that riddles and riddling dialogues were often employed in these daily lessons. They were brief, entertaining, and challenging for the pupils. Uh, it's perhaps worth noting that the sociologists J.M. Roberts and M.L. Foreman conducted a cross-cultural survey of riddling in 146 cultures in the human relations area file and found that riddles thrive in cultures where rote learning from authority figures is emphasized as well as oral questioning by these figures. They also postulated early training of the children as well as extreme cultural sensitivity to verbal ridicule as a correlative to active riddling tradition in a culture. Uh, it may or may not be relevant too that the punishment for not getting your material by rote and incorrectly answering the question was a, a bashing on the bare bottom. Uh, from all accounts, this is an accurate depiction of the formal education in the, in the Middle Ages. The riddles of Symphosius, which he modestly termed nugas, trifles, provided a thousand years instructive material for students of grammar. As late as 1604, the anonymous Jesuit author of the text Enigmata et Griffi Veterum et Recentium went back to Symphosian well for riddles with which to instruct beginners in Latin. Frederick Whitman discusses the pedagogical use of the riddle in The Medieval Scholar in his article on medieval riddling, in which he attributes the attention to trivial and commonplace subject matter, even in literary riddles, to a characteristically medieval effort to discern an encoded message, going back to Augustine, about the creator in each creature, however humble. He quotes a passage from Gregory the Great's Moralium, which points to the riddling quality of creation. When we look closely at the outer form of a thing, we are referred to its inner meaning, for the wonderful works of the visible world possess the marks of the creator, and though we are still not able to see him, we incline towards him in those things which he has made, we admire him. I would also add that the, while the riddle can be useful in instructing formal logic, there is a quality in many riddles which forces the reader to leap beyond deduction based on simple knowledge, to employ an insight which demands a readiness for the revelation of the unexpected, rather than active reliance on straight method. This wisdom too was valued even within the scholastic tradition which is often now ridiculed for its dry and plodding approach. It was actually enthralling in the time, we just think it's dry and plodding. Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas himself distinguishes between these two means to truth. Some have an abundance of knowledge as the result of learning and study, added to a native quickness of intelligence, and this is the true wisdom that Aristotle counts among the intellectual virtues. But others have wisdom as the result of the kinship which they have with the things of God. It is of such that the apostle says, the spiritual man judges all things. The gift of wisdom gives a man this eminent knowledge as a result of his union with God, and this union can only be by love. And therefore the gift of wisdom leads to an explicit gaze at the revealed truth which mere faith holds in a human manner, as it were, disguised. Indeed, though experts on medieval literary riddles such as Archer Taylor and F.H. Whitman tend to ignore or minimize <coughs> the intellectual content and interest of the literary riddle, it seems that the riddle is an entirely worthy vehicle of expression in that age in which categories and uni universals, the issues of relationship of attributes and identity, and the interaction of sensual perception and rational faculties all were matters of the greatest philosophical importance. From Augustine's discussion of the uses of signs in De Magistro through Thomas Aquinas' concern with language used with reference to God and his creatures, on down through Duns Scotus in the generation preceding Langland who formulated the concept of hiketas or thisness as the final element underlying the generic, that factor which informs our perception of something as present and distinct from similar entities is evident. Throughout the period, 
the particular characteristics of the riddle seem to underline and clarify other issues at hand while at the same time demonstrating their difficulty. Riddles offer no easy answer, that's the point. They demand both effort and knowledge and insight. The more disparate the signifier and the signified, the more triumphant the folding together in a single sign pointing both to the specific and the ineffable. In a riddle, one is presented with an apparently mutually exclusive set of categories suggested by the description, which are then reconciled in the answer. Langland uses riddles, as his early training disposed him to do, but with an admixture of the popular riddling tradition as well, creating a curious and powerful combination of the learned and the laywood, the learned and the low. Langland himself distinguished between japas, or japes, which he classes along with the low entertainments of what he calls farting, fiddling, juggling, and piping, no, all in a category. <coughs> Alan, I hope you note. <laughs> Think about that a little. Uh, they are respectable after-dinner entertainment at Conscience's banquet, though both the learned friar and the clergy are provoked by their inability to answer Patience's poser into making rather catty remarks indicating that perhaps the practice was uh, considered a little old-fashioned, a little dated, a little passe. Langland's use of riddles is that of one familiar with the pedagogical use of literary riddles as described by Whitman, but the form that he draws on is stylistically that of the popular riddle, with its highly formularized opening and closure and its relatively simple structure. While we cannot know for certain the kind of audience Langland intended to reach, his use of a simple, popular genre to express complex elements in his perception of truth would not be disdained by clerics or the sophisticated new class of lay readers proposed as Langland's most probable audience, nor would the use of riddles leave behind the more humble audience, those who may have used the figure of peers as a rallying point, in fact, during the Peasants' Revolt of 1381. In Langland's paradoxical wedding of the concrete and the commonplace to abstraction and allegory, the riddle, the popular riddle, is the most concise medium possible. In one particular passage, the poet demonstrates an extraordinary ability to poise the demands of the intellectual, the spiritual, and the profane in a relationship of what I think is stunning power and originality and unresolved ambiguity. The narrator describes the encounter, and I'm sort of translating as I go along. Folk held me for a fool, and in that folly I raved, till reason had pity on me and rocked me to sleep, till I saw as if it were magic, a subtle thing withal. One without tongue and teeth told me whether I, where I should go, and where I came from, and of what nature I was. I conjured him at last, if you were Christ's creature, for Christ's love to tell me. When the dreamer asks his name, the creature replies at some length, well, when I quicken the body, I'm called anima, and when I wish and would, I'm called animus, and, <coughs> sorry. And he goes through a whole list of characteristics which are here, thank you. Um, and, and because I, I, I am aware of and understand, I am called men's or mind. And when I make moan to God, memory is my name. And when I make judgments and do as truth teaches, then ratio, reason, is my name. And when I feel, uh, have empathy really with what folk tell me, my first name is Senses. And that, and that is wit and wisdom, the wellspring of all crafts. And he goes on and, and cites as an origin for all of this Augustine and, and Isidorus, which is uh, probably in fact the case. Uh, Langland, through Anima, uh, claims as his source for this category, Isidore and Augustine, uh, probably by way of Alcuin, um, which Langland was probably more familiar with than uh, Isidore and uh, Augustine. Uh, the relevant passage in Isidore reads just, uh, I am animus, 
um, and therefore uh, I make to live. Um, I am also contemplation, and when I'm contemplation, I'm spirit, and when I feel, I'm senses, and so forth, through the whole catalog. That's straightforward description. But Langland, by casting the passage in first person and personifying the abstraction, uh, forces on us the paradox of multiple identity of anima within a single personified ident entity. The self-description of anima and the challenge to the dreamer to choose an appropriate name irresistibly calls to mind the form of the riddle, or would certainly have done so for an audience of Langland's day, substantially increasing the ambigu ambiguous tension of the scene. Now, Langland has prepared his audience for a riddling interaction with anima even before the creature opens its non-existent mouth. The word subtle used of anima, a subtle thing withal, in Langland's time <coughs> retained its alchemical meaning of vapor-like and also you know, transformative in the sense of alchemy, something that changes into something else. Um, if you consider the curious nature of this vaporous and subtle being, which speaks with neither tongue nor teeth, telling the dreamer where he, the dreamer, came from and of what kind, um, there, there is an obvious answer in medieval riddling. Uh, the obvious serious allusion in medieval literary riddling would be to one's soul. But Langland is also playing off a popular tradition of a very different import in this introduction of anima, making use of a riddle type popular in England and European tradition attested at least since the 14th century, and in fact still being told in some areas. So, I would like you to channel your inner seven-year-old and listen up. I am neither fish nor flesh nor voice, yet when I am boy born, I make a noise. Fatherless and motherless, born without a skin, spoke when it came into the world and never spoke sin. That's a 19th century Lincolnshire riddle. There is a thing born without sin, dies without skin. He spoke one time in his mother's belly and he never spoke again. It's at 20th century Antilles. Nice German one. I sing without tongue and I shriek without lung and I bring both joy and distress and I have no heart. And a nice Latin one, I am born, born without fur, I do not hear, but truly nevertheless I am heard. I am not at all to blame, but I am wrongly accused. <laughs> now this still comes up a lot, you know, dogs and grandmothers and so forth. Uh, and, and finally, uh, this is a very charming medieval riddle. Quelle est la plus joyeuse chose du monde? What is the most joyous thing in the world? It is a fart because it is born singing and sings right up until its death. <laughs> there is then reason to believe that this riddle type was familiar to Langland's audience as the popular, similary, as the popular medieval simile goes. It was like the horse that farted on Noah's Ark. Everyone in the world heard it. <laughs> There is no need, I think, to be squeamish about accepting the possibility of a reference to popular scatological riddle in this context. After all, the boy in Chaucer's Sumner's tale offers a pragmatic solution to the problem of the fair division of a fart into 13 parts, one for each friar in a convent. And this problem must unavoidably have reminded some listeners of an important theological issue, the division of a seemingly indivisible bodiless entity, um, that is, Christ into numerous, uh, numerous embodied forms in the context of the Eucharist for, com for communal partaking, so everybody can benefit from it. Uh, Chaucer had license to play frivolously with scatological themes alluding to theological mysteries, so it's reasonable to think that Langland's deeply serious intent in Will's scene with anima, uh, this juxtaposition would, not, would have been unsettling but not untenable. The scatological reference in Will's first meeting with Anima makes this strange, many-named, many-functioned figure yet more striking and ambiguous. The nature of the human soul in all of its complexity is riddle enough to remind the narrator and ourselves that this creature, part of all of us, has characteristics in common with the lowly fart, requires a serious reevaluation of one's categories of bodiless entities. This kind of reevaluation resulting from shock 
that is one of the conspicuous cognitive functions of riddling. In connection with a specific set of examples relating to Langland's subtle thing, uh, I'd like to broaden our context by looking at a gallery of stone carvings and illuminations, uh, all adhering to or in the margins of creations of high seriousness, uh, physical churches, ecclesiastical manuscripts. And uh, for this, uh, I have to thank my graduate assistant, Kristen Clark, who was enormously helpful. Kristen, you know, let us know where you are. There she is. Yes. <laughs> Um, those of you who are of my scholarly cohort will, I suspect, be reminded of Mikhail Bakhtin's discussion of the carnivalesque and will recognize his categories of uh, tempor temporary and temporal permission for familiar and free interaction, eccentric behavior, carnivalistic misalliances, and sacrilege. Um, and by the way, I, I want to remind you all of Umberto Eco's Name of the Rose, in which the plot turns on the, the, a lost book of Aristotle, a suppressed book of Aristotle's on laughter. So we will go to our slideshow, our little gallery. We start with exaggeration. And this, this is actually cheating just a little bit. Uh, this is the Bayeux Tapestry, uh, clearly very serious, but not ecclesiastical in nature. But this is the famous uh, Alfgiva uh, conundrum, very mysterious, the Alfgiva episode where uh, a woman is being intimately touched, her veil is being raised by an unidentified person. Uh, there's some really interesting phallic stuff going on here and here. And then there is this little, rather well-endowed fellow down here whose, uh, whose arm gesture is mimicking, uh, echoing the gesture of this gentleman. Now, uh, this is of course a cleric, uh, as you can see from his taunts here, um, but he has this peculiar sort of penis with a kind of fish head and uh, extra large scrota and then this long leggy thing and I don't know what's down here. Kristen, you can maybe find that out for me sometime. Um, that's, a, that's from a legal document. Um, we also have, um, this, yeah, this, this is, um, yeah, it, it was noted to me before the presentation that um, this, this face emerging from the buttocks with uh, descending scrota, uh, resembles a folklorist, a certain folklorist, in uh, a state of, of uh, fury. And uh, you know, I will leave it to you uh, to name that folklorist. But it's being observed by this monkey in, uh, in clerical garb. And monkeys, of course, were commonly invoked in this context. Now, um, everybody's favorite along these lines, and the dismay of Victorian scholars, is the famous Sheila Nagig. Um, and it's wonderful to see how the Victorians would describe these figures. Um, the one on, uh, this, this one is from Kilpeck Church, and is a very famous uh, image from the Kilpeck School, uh, the Hereford School of Sculpture, which is very near Wales and understood to have all sorts of, you know, sort of interesting connections with Welsh uh, mythic pre-Christian stuff. And that may be as it may be, but um, you know, it, the, the Victorians like to describe this kind of figure as a lady acrobat. <laughs> yeah, uh, or. Um, the opening of the gates of hell. You know, this, is, this would where you would go if you were a very bad person. Um, male type person one assumes, but not necessarily. Um, and this is, this is a somewhat less defined, but these are, very, these are quite common. They're, they're very common in Ireland. Uh, they're at least 20 extant. And especially in the Hereford region, they're not at all uh, uncommon. And what I really want to draw your attention to is not only the, um, the, the vigorous uh, obscenity of the image, but her face, you know, I mean, she's, she's having a, the sacrifice having a good time. And it's, you know, truthfully, it's funny. It's just flat out funny. Uh, we also have inversions of role. 
we have this um, sort of mermaid, well, no, I'm sorry, this isn't a mermaid. Uh, this is a woman beating her presumably husband. You know, so this is, this is not the normal way things happen. It's a, it's a carnivalesque inversion. Uh, other kinds of inversion include monkeys riding, monkeys riding backwards. Anybody running backwards was con riding a horse backwards was considered to be very amusing, but monkeys doing it was even better. Uh, that's a little closer view of, it's hard, hard to tell whether that's really more like a man. Uh, 14th century, again, Hereford, uh, you know, this, this kind of, th these are misery cords, <coughs> those little things that monks could rest their buttocks on. So you already have a, a, a kind of potential scatological contact, contextual element. Um, you also have flatulence. Uh, who could resist that? Especially in the context of this paper. Um, and this is lovely. That, you know, there's a bishop instructing a tonsured monk with you know, a beautifully delineated puff of flatulence coming out of his anus. We have a horse, oops, sorry, horse uh, trumpet, I suppose, is the best description. <laughs> That's, uh oh, I lost it. Sorry. I knew this would happen. Um, yeah, there's the horse trumpet, and the acrobat is on him sort of upside down. Um, that's from a book of hours, interestingly enough. Um, naturally, we can't pass up on defecation. And this is particularly rich because of the wonderful potential conflation of defecation with the function of the gargoyle. So we have you know, there, that's lovely. And uh, the misery cords also, you know, a little dump. <laughs> um, uh, of course, in a church context, that's a 15th century Freiburg uh, German gargoyle. Uh, more gargoyles, and I particularly like the expression on this fellow's face because, you know, we all can recognize that. It um, reminds me of, of, of apocryphal stories of Elvis's passing. Um, this, so to speak, sorry. Um, yeah, this is a particularly uh, elaborate one that includes the scrotum and penis. Um, this is a demon giving it his all and kind of giving himself a little help there. Um, that's Portugal. Um, this, this is, and remember, this, these are all things that you'll be looking at from below, although presumably not under the spout. Um, this is Armenian, and I don't exactly know what the nature of the text is, except that it's ecclesiastical, but we, you know, we have a lovely um, turd. <laughs> what else can I say? We have uh, a 12th century St. Peter's Church in Hampshire. And lest you think it was all about defecation, um, there are some examples of micturation as well, peeing. And I particularly think this is amazing because if you look carefully, this is a little jug. And it's kind of not unlike what you're given at hospitals if you're a gentleman, um, you know, where a certain amount of aim is necessary. And again, it's an angel. <laughs> So, you know, work that out for yourself. <laughs> um, we also have forbidden liaisons. Um, this is fairly tame as such things go, but uh, this is a cleric who is uh, paying off a perfectly delighted prostitute. Uh, very thrilled, so that's, you know, that's an inappropriate liaison. Uh, we also have bestiality. Uh, there's a rabbit being inappropriate. You know, and a rabbit being inappropriate. I'm not, you know, I'm not quite sure what directionality is involved here, um, but you, you can work that out. There's nothing in the context that will tell you. Um, naturally, we have masturbation, and, and interestingly, female masturbation. I think this is really quite remarkable because look, I mean, does that not remind you of Bernini? You know, I mean, you know, perhaps. Not in quite such a, a, an apotheosis of <laughs> sexual bliss, but you know, this is another angle on the same gal. Um, there, there's a gentleman going at it. You can use your own favorite metaphor. Um, finally, naturally, preoccupation with anal matters. 
in gen sort of in a generalized sense. Here's a little anal intercourse uh, of the primate variety and um, you know, being spoken to by a tonsured type person with a very peculiar scepter uh, from a psalter, right? And uh, let's not forget fellatio. Um, sometimes this is a little difficult to determine because of the resemblance between certain medieval instruments and certain masculine instruments, so I'm not perfectly certain, but I think the suggestion is certainly there, certainly possible. Um, in more explicit terms, we have this exciting representation um, where it's kind of, you know, I'm not quite sure about what's going on there, but this is pretty clear. You know, this, uh, this is, uh, that's, wow. Um, <laughs> And then finally, it's just flat, plain old buttock display. What's funnier than mooning, you know, even if you're a carving? Um, this, you know, this guy's sort of jolly. Um, you know, his equipment is all ready. Um, again, from the Hereford School. Um, you know, this guy looks anxious. <laughs> I think. Um, and, you know, I just think we're totally right to find this funny. I think this is exactly the point. Um, sorry that I keep losing this. We'll come back <laughs> if you wanted to. And I particularly like this because there's nothing explicitly uh, transgressive about this backward leaning figure. He may indeed be an acrobat. But if you look at the axis here, and this is a misery cord. And see how nicely it accommodates the monastic buttocks? You know, I just think that's really um, nice. And to, uh, to, to wrap it all up in one beautiful and inclusive package, we have buttock display, masturbation, and fellatio. Um, <laughs> from an Archbishop Konrad von Hochstaden statue uh, in the city of Köln. So, there you go. Um, let you catch your breath there a bit. That's, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the artists who put these together really knew how to put the carnus in carnivalesque. Um, but remember, um, Bakhtin was rather specific in his application of carnival to a specific temporal ritual framework, Mardi Gras, Feast of Fools, you know, for us, Halloween, times like that, uh, within a highly rigid hierarchical setting, such as those suggested by Roberts and Foreman in their craft uh, constructs. Um, these carvings and drawings, and indeed riddles, are not bound to a particular uh, specific carnivalesque you know, period of the year or, or festival. Um, in fact, they're, they're permanently affixed to their contrastive serious loci. You know, they're on the church. They're on the church for good. And the manuscript marginalia, are, you know, they're there. And uh, perhaps in Barbara K. G.'s terms, we can view them as a kind of slow performance. Uh, something that's drawn out and, sorry, that's not good. I'm not gonna, I can't say a word from here on because it all comes out double. Um, draw out and underline an ongoing paradox rather than the chaotic single side of a pendulum swinging between chaos and order. We have then a juxtaposition of a popular scatological riddle with a riddle-like statement entirely consistent with the structure and content of such, such expressions in the pedagogical scholastic tradition and vernacular expressions of such tensions informing the interstices of ecclesial art. While scholars such as Le Goff tend to see the institution of the church standing in opposition to the traditional worldview of the folk, uh, it's surely prudent to remember that the church was made up of individuals and these individuals per participated in the general vernacular milieu of their time as well as in the tradition specific to life within the clerical world. The interworking of these elements in the passage from Pierce Plowman creates a complexity difficult to, oh God, damn, penetrate. Um, the, <laughs> the, the mystery posed by the identity of anima proves to be literally unresolvable. 
Neither native wit nor trained reason availed a narrator whose attempts to unravel the riddle are met with hostile ridicule on the part of Anima, who warns Will not to answer at all when it appears that his curiosity is motivated merely by pertinacious pride. Once again, the, ep the episode lacks the closure that the social activity of riddle riddling normally requires. The riddle, like Will, is left off balance and uncertain in the face of mysteries which are finally unapproachable, ineffable, but also risible. Langland was a master of serious play with matters of deep and subtle import, and his work is unlike anything else in the literature of theology or fantasy. His effect is achieved in part by a crafty and craftsmanlike blending of familiar popular forms and themes with his own highly idiosyncratic understanding of the philosophical and religious issues of his time. In the end, the unresolvable mystery of this poet lies in the convergence of tradition, academic form, and individual genius. One may be forgiven for quoting the subtle doctor himself, John Duns Scotus, who in a different context held, quare voluntas voluit hoc nulla est causa, nisi quia voluntas est voluntas, which is roughly translated to say, there is no reason why Will willed this, if not simply because Will is Will. His nugas, his trifles, and quaestinculas, his little queries, raise the laughter of shock and delight, like all those bare buttocks spouting rainwater shit that adorn uh, medieval church exteriors. They may seem to us an accretion, sing, clinging like improbable barnacles to the sturdy planks of Mother Church, but they are truly part of, intrinsic to, the fabric, for in their outrageousness, they raise for us not only the big laughs, but the big questions and the ultimate mysteries. I think it's always a good policy to leave with the man who brought you. Augustine of Hippo wrote one of his most moving works, De Magistro, as a dialogue with his beloved son, Adeodatus. Uh, it's kind of like Gregory Bateson's uh, essay on play in which it was a questioning with his daughter. Augustine's discourse is all the more moving because we, as readers, know that Adeodatus was dead by the age of 16. At one point, Augustine breaks off from his philosophical and theological speculations and speaks to the boy directly in words that suggest to us the divine meaning of these diversions, divigations, digressions, and divisions. It is hard to say at this point what goal we are striving to reach by all these roundabout paths. Probably you think we have been just playing a game and diverting the mind from serious things by these seemingly childish questionings. And yet if I say there is a life eternally blessed and that my desire is that God, who is very truth, should bring us thither by steps suited to our poor abilities, I am afraid I shall appear ridiculous because I set out on so long a journey with the consideration of signs and not the realities they signify. You will pardon me, therefore, if I play with you to begin with, not for the sake of playing, but in order to exercise and sharpen our mental powers so that we may be able not only to endure the heat and brightness of the region where lies the blessed light, but also to love them. And just to clarify, in case you can't see this misery cord, uh, it's a circumcision. It's a circum there's, a, there's the knife. But the, the infant is suckling at the same time, which I just think is flat out weird. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you so much, Erica, for um, bringing this wonderful um, presentation to us, which requires a response and requires some dialogue from all of us. So I'm um, honored to be able to introduce Sabina Mayoka. She's professor of anthropology and folklore at California State University, Northridge. 
She's published on Sardinian festivals and globalization, the art and iconography of the modern pagan movement, religion, folklore, food waste, festival legend, witchcraft and neo-paganism in Europe and the United States. She's a recipient of Guggenheim, NEH, Fulbright and Hewlett Fellowships. She's a fellow of the American Folklore Society. Her current research project is on animals and the spiritual imagination. Welcome, Sabina. Thank you, Maggie, for that introduction. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Um, thank you, Erica, for that amazing paper. Uh, and thank you, Leonard, for inviting me to be the respondent to this paper. This is, this is quite a challenging task, because as you've all heard, um, Erica has given us a masterful set of juxtapositions and contradictions and riddles to think about. Um, and moreover, um, as you heard from Maggie's introduction, I know absolutely bugger all about riddles. <laughs> or medieval literature, or really any of this. So, um, so that in itself is an enigma, right? You know, why would you pick of all the people in the American Folklore Society who could respond to this amazing paper, somebody who is not a Christian, not a medievalist, um, knows nothing about riddles, uh, and, and is in fact sort of an, an anti some of this, right? You know, a person who works on witchcraft and things like that. So, so ponder that for a minute. <laughs> so um, Erica's paper, I think, has given us a riddle. And the riddle is, how do we explain the presence of the obscene, the scatological, the transgressive, uh, as part of ecclesiastical medieval culture, whether it occurs in poetry, as, in, as it does in Piers Plowman, or in art, architecture, embroidery, you know, and, and other means. This riddle forces us to confront the uncomfortable idea that we often has, have as folklorists and that we have inherited from our discipline that somehow elite culture, high culture, is completely separate from vernacular culture. And it pushes the idea that, of course, Leonard uh, made evident, but that ultimately does come from the scholarship of Don Yoder. And that is the idea that the vernacular is something that we all live regardless of our social class, regardless of our administrative position uh, in the greater hierarchy. We all have that capacity. We all, we all live in the vernacular as well as participating in these other levels of society. And so we all carry within us these fundamental contradictions that folklore addresses and that riddles address. So let me go back for a moment to the little that, that I know about riddles. It's funny because I just finished doing a, a, a week on this with my introduction to folklore class. And one of the things that I tell my undergraduates is that riddles render the familiar unfamiliar in the words of Archer Taylor. They are metaphors. They are metaphors that, uh, again, to borrow from another scholar, the great British anthropologist Mary Douglas, uh, work in a, very much the way that humor does, very much as in, uh, in, in the manner of incongruity theory, by juxtaposing two incompatible ideas. Now, the humor lies in seeing the possible relationship between these two disparate ideas. And so in Piers Plowman, we have essentially the, the riddle, which is, how is a soul like a fart? How is a soul like a fart, right? How is a soul like a fart? A soul is like a fart because both are vaporous. You can't see them. 
and yet you very definitely know their presence. <laughs> they seem to be um, at opposite ends of what it means to be human, right? One of us grounding, one of them grounding us very much in the material world, the world that our medieval ancestors thought of as inherently corrupt uh, and inherently sort of constantly in the process of rotting like a big compost pile or a manure pile, if you will. Uh, but the other elevating us and giving us the promise of eternal salvation. So as alike as these two things are because of their invisible uh, and yet ineffably real qualities, they also point to our dual nature as human beings, that we, both, we are both material, we are both grounded in a, in a world of corruption, if, if, to, to use the medieval term, um, and yet we also have this great capacity for salvation. And it is through contemplating this riddle posed by anima that I think, I, I suspect, the author of Piers Plowman hoped that his audience would grok for want of a better term, uh, the inherent contradictions of being human, right? That we are these corrupt creatures who yet can attain these great heights if if we are willing to uh, if we are willing to to uh, give up all of the things that Catholicism wants us to give up. Now, let me say this, and I say this as someone who did not grow up. Catholic or even Christian. Some of you don't know this, but um, uh, my family, my Italian family on my mother's side was Jewish, and my father was a socialist psychoanalyst who thought that religion was the opiate of the people. So I did not grow up with any kind of religious training at all. I had to learn all of this stuff about Catholicism as I was doing fieldwork in Sardinia. Ponder that. Um, but let me just say that Christianity is a weird-ass religion. Right? <laughs> it is one of the weirder-ass religions that you can wrap your mind around because it asks us to accept a number of paradoxes. Now, for sure, pagan religions, and I'm talking about pagan with a small p, so antique, ancient pagan religions are filled with paradoxes too. You have gods that turn into um, animals in order to have sex with people, and then people who, women who give birth to these demigods, and you know, there, there's all kinds of wacky stuff happening in pagan religions. But fundamentally, the mysteries of pagan religions are not as weird as the mysteries of Christianity. Because pagan religions also did not require their adherents, number one, to be exclusive, and number two, to really believe anything at all. What we forget about pre-Christian religions is that they were religions of practice. They were not religions fundamentally of belief. They were orthopractic rather than orthodox. And here comes Christianity, a brand new religious movement. Just transport yourselves about you know, uh, 1,900 years into the past. Here comes this new religious movement in late antiquity uh, that says that you can have eternal life in some vaporous, fart-like form <laughs> through belief alone, right? Just through belief. Now, that strains the credulity of most rational people. This is not a rational religion. This isn't even the Eleusinian mysteries, right? Where you sacrifice a bunch of pigs, go through some odd initiation rite, and then in the end, the priestess holds up a head of wheat and says, rain conceive. You know, plant this thing, rain, the seed will conceive. You go out and be fertile. This is cool. That is easy to wrap your head around, particularly if you make a living through agriculture. This other stuff is, is not. And it requires the kind of, um, it requires a kind of mental subtlety <coughs> to wrap your head around. So let me go back to the context in which the riddles in Piers, the riddles in Piers Plowman were presented and the context in which some of these obscene images uh, were presented. In the Middle Ages, you have a population that is converted to Christianity. You have almost 100% conversion 
you, you do have 100% conversion in England at the time in which Piers Plowman was written. There's, there's no more paganism around. But you do have a largely non-literate populace uh, that has to be instructed in these things, whether through visual means or uh, in the case of the children being taught their letters, boys being taught their letters, through, these, um, through this form of play. And here I want to go back to something that Erica said towards the end uh, in that passage from uh, St. Augustine, in which he presents play as a form of practice to sharpen our wits. Yesterday, Libby Tucker treated us to a wonderful remembrance of the children's folklore scholar Brian Sutton Smith, who was rightly focused on the role of play on the didactic role of play, on play's role not only in human evolution, but in teaching us as humans what it is to be human, how we should behave as humans. And here again, we see this play in the poem, in the didactic exercises, in the art, the sacred art, right? In, in art in sacred spaces, that through laughter, through play, is intended to be didactic, is intended to teach us something, to sharpen our wits. <coughs> so what is it that we are being asked to understand? What is it that we're being asked to grok? I think the paradox of these riddles is parallel to paradoxes that are at the center of Christianity as a religion. Uh, the paradox, for example, of an incarnate deity and an incarnate deity that doesn't incarnate to go out and party and have a good time, like some of the pagan gods, but who incarnates in order to suffer and die. The paradox of salvation by faith. The paradox that by giving up all of these earthly pleasures, we somehow can gain something else you know, eternal salvation, whatever that means. Because I'm not really sure what that means. And I'm not sure that a lot of Christians are sure what that means either. <coughs> uh, in this world, this medieval Christian world of deep contradictions, I think that riddles are the perfect medium with which to communicate these fundamental paradoxes because they habituate hearers to tolerating, to living with these contradictory juxtapositions that fundamentally cannot be neatly resolved. Um, you know, this is not like what goes in hard and stiff and comes out soft and gooey. We all know the answer to that, right? Right, what is it? Chewing gum, Chewing gum right. Yeah. Or um, another answer that I've heard is uh, the cook your cookie in, in tea or in coffee. Il biscotto nel tè, as my Italian, uh, pardon? Or spaghetti, spaghetti is another one. So these are fairly easy to, to, to resolve. This is, how is a raven like a writing desk? Or why did the chicken cross the road? Or why did the possum cross the road, for that matter? We just don't freaking know. <laughs> and we have to live with not knowing, right? We have to continue to exist with, with this not knowing, with this ambiguity, with this fundamentally irresolvable paradox. So in, in that sense, I think that these juxtapositions of the scatological, the transgressive, uh, with the sacred helped our forebears to hold in their minds these fundamentally irresolvable paradoxes in that weird, weird late antique cult that somehow, somehow, for some damn reason that I will never understand, <laughs> became the dominant religion in Europe. <laughs> that's, that's what I've got to say. Erica said that was absolutely perfect, and I'll say one last thing. Good, because I pulled it out of my ass. <laughs>
Um, we might have a few moments for some questions if you have a question in mind. <laughs> Or Sabina. Or Sabina, yeah. Yes, Myra. Um, this is a, a very simple question. I'm thinking about personal interest, but uh, out of all the, the sort of obscene images that you found, were there any flying foxes? Oh, um, yes. Yes? There were. There were some flying phalluses, and there were also several phallus trees, several penis trees. which And, and, the, and the penis trees, um, I, I can't even remember why I didn't include that. I think it was hard to fit in my categorization. But um, the, the penis tree, one of the, my, the most delightful of the penis trees has this perfectly lovely medieval lady, you know, with a basket, and yes. she's like plucking them. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with the, and, and there, uh, it was common Roman uh, visual theme, too. Yes. Yes, yes, wonderful thought. Uh, any other comments or questions? Uh, yes. Hi, so I don't know how many people were on the panel earlier, but it's a similar, one of the topics is similar, and I was just wondering, uh, the, that scholar proposed that um, some of these transgressive imagery was uh, the non-order people coming in contact with religion, the people in the harbors, I think everybody was doing it. I really do. Um, I think the you know the stone carvers are a particular category, and they're they're extremely interesting. In fact, Kilpeck Church alone is this fascinating kind of assemblage of mysterious carvings. Um, some of which are gone because the you know the Victorians went around with their umbrellas and bashed off the principal parts. Um, an ancestor of mine. Uh, was the, the noble who built Kilpeck, so I have a particular interest in that. Um, you know, there are a lot of mysteries. We don't really know who the stone carvers were except through what they carved. Um, you know, we can infer some things. Uh, the same is true of the, the manuscript uh, illuminations. But I am absolutely convinced that everybody, uh, you know, that there was a kind of general um, not just tolerance, but uh, an, an embracing of this kind of juxtaposition, uh, or at the very least, uh, you know, it was not a, a, a scandal. And the other, the other favorite Victorian explanation for these things is that they were survivals of, you know, pre-Christian, yeah. blah blah. Well, you know, I mean, the Sheila and Gig, very probably, um, but the Sheila and Gig is also terrifically funny. Uh, you know whether you construe her as a as a, an acrobat or a fertility goddess. You know she's she's got a shit eating grin on her face, and uh, and 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 that's you know I don't and it's quite different from the sort of Etruscan mystery smile. You know it's it's a uh, there's something truly comical. Yes, Sabina, did you? Have... Oh yes. <laughs> Turn around so everybody can see it. <laughs> no, you know, these spaces, if, if nothing else, these, these uh, stone carvers, many of them had a, a tremendous command of, of, of facial expressiveness, even in extremely simplified forms, such as what you find in the Hereford School. Um, so, I, I, you know, I can't say that I know, but I don't think that it was just a kind of just a position of a poorly informed but talented bunch of artists, um, you know, kind of thrown onto the scaffolding to do these representations. Uh, nor do I think that it was necessarily, uh, well, we just don't know. We just don't know. We do know that whoever, the, 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 the um, Kilpeck um, church was probably uh, informed in part by um, a, a stone carver or someone who instructed the stone carvers on carvings that were seen on the pilgrimage road to Santiago de Compostela, which is an interesting thing. Other comments, questions? Um, yes, way in the back. Oh, Wolfgang. <laughs> Ah. 
Well, of course. Yes. Right. <coughs> right. They're hinged. Right. You know, I think that's, I, I think there's truth in that as well, but I, I, I you know, and, th and that, that is another form of explanation um, that I, is to me in the same category as, uh, you know, these are, these are allegorical forms or their, their survivals. Yes, I think very likely, but I, I think that there's also uh, another element to them that has to do with the, a kind of permission to just oppose uh, the, these, um, these, these, these extreme forms with some sense of meaning um, and, and not, just, um, not just our contemporary sense of naughtiness, as delightful as that is. Well, thank you all so much. <laughs> <laughs>